Thank you to Warby Parker for sponsoring this video. For those not familiar, Warby Parker is a company offering prescription glasses, contacts, and sunglasses at a fraction of the price of most outlets in which you can get sent right to your door. As summer is still in full swing for those of us living on the proper half of the planet and that bright glowing orb in the sky is bombarding us all with excessive amounts of ambient light, I had Warby Parker send me five pairs of sunglasses in my home try-on kit, which I'll rotate through for the rest of this read and you can give me your feedback on which one is the best in the comments below. Warby Parker's free home try-on kits come with no obligation to buy a prepaid return label right in the box and of course five pairs of glasses of your choice which you can then have five days to check out before sending them back alternatively if you're a contact lens kind of person they have those two with their breathable scout lenses which are made from a super moist material that resists drying for lasting hydration and comfort the trial pack includes six days worth of contacts for only five dollars and then you get five dollars off your next warby parker order back to the glasses the glasses start at just 95 dollars including prescription lenses which have anti-glare and anti-scratch coatings the sunglasses also start at $95, including polarized lenses, scratch resistance, and 100% UV protection. They're also available with prescription lenses starting at $175. To get started, head over to warbyparker.com forward slash brain food to order your free home try-on kit today. Now let's get into the video. The phrase, the peaceful use of nuclear weapons, might sound like the ultimate oxymoron. While nuclear reactors are widely used to peacefully generate electricity and medical isotopes, it is difficult to imagine a peaceful use for atomic bombs on account of, you know, the whole boom and devastating radioactivity. But incredibly, between 1961 and 1989, both the United States and the Soviet Union conducted hundreds of atomic tests in order to develop non-military applications for nuclear weapons. and. Even more incredibly, some of these tests actually worked. This is the story of Project Plowshare and Nuclear Explosions for the National Economy, two of the most audacious projects to come out of the Cold War. Project Plowshare, named after a passage in the Book of Isaiah reading, They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, was officially launched in 1957. The project had its origins in the first Soviet atomic bomb test, which took place at the Semipalatinsk test site in Kazakhstan on September the 23rd, 1949. The test, codenamed RDS-1, shook the American defense establishment to its core. Experts had predicted that the USSR was still 10 years away from developing an atomic bomb, not realizing that during the war, a network of spies had infiltrated the top-secret Los Alamos laboratory in New Mexico and stolen all of the technical data that the Soviets needed to run their own atomic program. The detonation of the first Soviet thermonuclear or hydrogen bomb on August the 12th, 1953, only served to hammer the point home. If America was to survive, it had to start building bombs and fast. But there was a problem. The American public, having seen the horrific devastation and suffering wrought by atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, was unlikely to support an all-out nuclear arms race. Facing a major public relations disaster on December 8, 1953, President Dwight D. Eisenhower stood before the United Nations and delivered what came to be known as the Atoms for Peace speech, outlining a new direction for American nuclear policy. He stated, The United States would seek more than the mere reduction or elimination of atomic materials for military purposes. It is not enough to take this weapon out of the hands of the soldiers. It must be put into the hands of those who will know how to strip its military casing and adapt to it the arts of peace. The United States knows that if the fearful trend of atomic military buildup can be reversed, this greatest of destructive forces can be developed into a great boon for the benefit of all mankind. Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace program represented a dramatic reversal in American nuclear policy, which since 1946 had forbidden the sharing of nuclear secrets, even with close allies such as Britain and France. The program would see the US helping over 30 allied nations set up their own peaceful nuclear programs, providing technical expertise, reactors, and even highly enriched uranium fuel. Meanwhile, back at home, the Atomic Energy Commission built dozens of civilian nuclear power plants and even a nuclear-powered cargo ship, the MS Savannah. But while this campaign was effective in keeping allied nations on side and promoting the new atomic age to the American public, it wasn't enough to keep America ahead of the accelerating arms race. Building a nuclear stockpile meant more than just building reactors. Nuclear weapons design still had to be constructed, tested, 
and refined. Thankfully, the Soviets themselves had provided a possible answer to this conundrum. On November 10, 1949, a little more than a month after the first Soviet nuclear test, Representative Andrei Vashinsky gave a speech before the United Nations outlining his country's plan to carry out a very different kind of nuclear program. The Soviet Union did not use atomic energy for the purpose of accumulating stockpiles of atomic bombs. It was using atomic energy for purposes of its own domestic economy, blowing up mountains, changing the course of rivers, irrigating deserts, charting new paths of life in regions untrodden by human foot. Progressive science claims that it is possible to utilize the noble force of the explosions builder for peaceful purposes. With the help of directional explosions, one can straighten out the beds of large rivers, construct gigantic dams, cut canals. Indeed, the perspectives to disclose die to the new atomic energy are unlimited. Indeed, the idea of using nuclear weapons for non-military purposes is as old as nuclear weapons themselves. In 1945, Otto Frisch, a senior scientist in the Manhattan Project, had proposed using nuclear explosions as a source of high-energy neutrons for scientific experiments, while in 1950, Los Alamos physicist Fred Raines had written a paper exploring the possibility of using atomic bombs to excavate canals or mine valuable minerals. But Raines had concluded that such uses appear at best to be extremely limited in scope owing to the radio activity hazard associated with atomic explosions. However, the development of thermonuclear weapons allowed the construction of so-called clean bombs, up to 98% of whose power is derived from nuclear fusion. Thus, devices generate relatively little radioactive fallout, opening the floodgates to a deluge of audacious proposals. And we really do mean audacious. Some of the suggested civilian uses for nuclear weapons included widening the Panama Canal, blasting a brand new Panatomic Canal through Nicaragua, blasting giant caverns for storing oil and gas, connecting underground aquifers in Arizona, melting iceberg ice gems, blasting a route for Interstate 40 through the Bristol Mountains of California, changing the course of rivers, and melting Canada's Athabasca tar sands to allow the oil to be more easily pumped out. But the most grandiose of these projects was Project Chariot, a plan to excavate a deepwater harbor on Cape Thompson, Alaska, using a chain of five atomic bombs. Alaska, having just become the 49th state, the local residents were surprisingly keen on the idea. A 1960 editorial in the Fairbanks News Miner stated, We think the holding of a huge nuclear blast in Alaska would be a fitting overture to the new era which is opening for our state. But one group was decidedly less enthusiastic, the indigenous Inuapat people of nearby Point Hope, who along with environmental groups like the Wilderness Society, Sierra Club, and Committee for Nuclear Information, campaigned vigorously against the project. It didn't help that despite all the time and resources the government was pouring into the project, nobody actually had any use for the proposed harbor. And so, after nearly four years of planning and debate, in 1962, Project Chariot was quietly shelved. In the end, the objectives of Project Plowshare were narrowed down to six main areas. Excavation, energy generation, isotope generation, oil and gas stimulation, particle physics experiments, and geophysics. Between 1961 and 1975, a total of 31 atomic explosions were conducted as part of the project. The first plowshare test, codenamed GNOME, took place on December 10, 1961. The 3.1 kiloton device was detonated at a depth of 361 meters in a salt bed 39 kilometers southeast of Carlsbad, New Mexico, blasting a massive cavity 52 meters wide and 24 meters tall. The goals of the project were fourfold. First, it was expected that the rock salt would absorb the tremendous heat of the blast and retain it for a long period, allowing water to be pumped into the cavity to produce steam and generate electricity. Second, the intense neutron flux from the blast would transmute some of the salt into useful heavy radioisotopes, which could be harvested by dissolving the salt with water. This same neutron flux was also used to conduct several particle physics experiments. And finally, atomic physicists had theorized that detonating nuclear weapons in underground caverns would disguise their seismic signature, making the nuclear tests harder for enemy nations to detect, and the gnome shot was used to test this theory. However, of these experiments, only the particle physics test proved successful. When scientists drilled into the cavity, they found that the walls and ceiling had collapsed, mixing in rubble with the molten salt and reducing its temperature such that no useful energy could be extracted. Also, though the cavity was supposed to be self-sealing, a plume of radioactive dust escaped to the surface, 
causing a bit of a PR disaster. Nonetheless, Project Plowshare plowed on. The next test, codenamed Sedan, took place at Yucca Flats on the Nevada test site on July 6, 1962. This experiment was intended to test the feasibility of using nuclear weapons for large-scale excavation projects. The 104-kiloton device, detonated at a depth of 194 meters, displaced some 11 million tons of earth, blasting a crater 390 meters across and 100 meters deep, and registering 4.75 on the Richter scale. It also generated a substantial amount of fallout, sending two plumes of radioactive dust to an altitude of 5 kilometers that drifted east over Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Illinois. So dirty was this single explosion that it generated a full 7% of the total fallout produced by the Nevada test site, which between 1951 and 1992 carried out over 1,000 nuclear tests. Despite this, the Sedan shot did make an important contribution to science, allowing geologists to conclude that the Barringer Crater in Arizona, today known as Meteor Crater, was formed by a meteorite impact and not a volcanic eruption as previously believed. Work on nuclear excavation also continued, with the majority of the remaining 29 plowshare experiments being devoted to testing cleaner devices for this purpose. The largest of these, codenamed Buggy, took place on March 12, 1968, and involved the detonation of five one-kiloton devices in a chain to investigate the feasibility of digging canals. But perhaps the most unusual and promising of the plowshare tests took place on December 10, 1967, in northern New Mexico. Codenamed Gas Buggy, the objective of the test was to use a 29-kiloton device detonated at a depth of 1,300 meters to fracture a formation of oil and gas-bearing shale, making the fossil fuels easier to extract. In other words, atomic fracking. While the concept worked, the extracted gas was found to be too radioactive for household use. Gas Buggy was followed by Project Rullison in 1969 and Project Rio Blanco in 1973, both carried out in gas fields in Colorado. These tests managed to produce gas that was only 1% more radioactive than background levels, but by this time the growing anti-nuclear movement had made even mild contamination unviable for customers. Further, due to the staggering cost of the project, $82 million, about half a billion dollars today in all, it was determined that even after 25 years of gas production, only around 40% of this investment could be recovered. In 1975, funding for Project Plowshare dried up, and the project officially came to an end. At the same time as Project Plowshare, the Soviet Union was conducting their own peaceful nuclear explosions program. Despite being the first to propose such a project, the Soviets were actually several years behind the Americans in launching theirs. Indeed, upon the announcement of Project Plowshare at the Second International Congress, Conference on the Peaceful Uses of Atomic Energy in 1958, Soviet delegate Vasily Emelyanov disavowed previous statements by his countrymen and accused the American project of being merely a cover to evade suspension of bomb tests which do not reach practical ends but only political ends. Nonetheless, not wanting to fall behind in the arms race, in 1965 the Soviets reluctantly initiated their own peaceful nuclear explosions project known as Nuclear Explosions for the National Economy. In terms of objective the Soviet project was very similar to plowshares, with the main focus being on excavation, oil and gas stimulation, ore crushing, and geophysics. But it was also far larger in scale, with 156 tests being conducted between 1965 and 1989. One of the most famous tests of the series was the Chagan shot carried out on January 15, 1965. A 140-kiloton device was exploded on the bed of the Chagan River in the Semipalatinsk test site, blasting a crater 408 meters wide and a 100 meters deep. The wall of the crater was then excavated to let the river flow in, creating an artificial reservoir with a capacity of 10,000 cubic meters. While still radioactive, Lake Shigan, also known as Lake Balapan or Atomic Lake, is still used to water local cattle herds to this day. Another major test site of the Soviet program was the Tiger Shot of March the 23rd, 1971. This was part of a decades-old plan called the Pechorikamar Canal, which sought to divert water from northern Russian rivers into the Volga Basin and down into the Caspian and sea to aid with irrigation. Three 15-kiloton devices were detonated in a line near the town of Vasyakovo permablast, blasting a crater over 600 meters long. Unfortunately, due to the soft stone in the region, the crater walls collapsed, reducing the depth of the prototype canal to an unusable 10 meters. Scientists concluded that nuclear weapons were unsuited to digging canals, and the Pechorakama project was abandoned in 1986. Other tests followed along the same lines as plowshare, including shots butane, griffin, Akatak, Gula, Neva, and Helium, all geared towards stimulating oil and gas fields. Like their American counterparts, these tests were largely successful, increasing oil and gas production by up to 40%. And unlike the Americans, the Soviets had no qualms about using slightly irradiated
created fuel. But ultimately, as with plowshare, the technique never saw widespread commercial adoption. Yet, despite its similarities to the American project, nuclear explosions for the national economy holds the distinction of carrying out the only truly practical, peaceful nuclear explosions in history. On December 1, 1963, drillers at the Urtabulak gas field in Uzbekistan lost control of well number 11, causing it to blow out and vent over 12 million cubic meters of gas per day, enough to supply a city the size of St. Petersburg. Over the next three years, many attempts were made to cap the well, but none were successful. As the bottom of the well had not been cemented, even a successful capping just caused gas to vent into other nearby wells. Finally, in 1966, having run out of options, the Soviet government decided to break out the big guns. In the fall of that year, a 44-centimeter diameter slanted borehole was drilled to within 25 meters of the well, and a 30-kiloton device was inserted. On September 30, 1966, the device was detonated, creating a shockwave that pinched the unruly well shut. 23 seconds later, the flame went out, and the well was back under control. The technique would be repeated four more times at the Pamukka gas field in 1968, the Maysky and Kritish gas field in 1972, and the Chumzinski gas field in 1981. All were highly successful except for the last shot, which due to poor geological data unfortunately failed to seal the well. In 1989, in response to local protests in Kazakhstan, the Soviet government agreed to a moratorium on nuclear testing, and the peaceful nuclear explosions program finally came to an end. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.